I'm a long-time activist. I have been involved in the uh, anti-globalization movement, in the movements against uh, war, solidarity with Palestine, uh, the Occupy movements, and all kind of uh, unions uh, in the university. And I'm also a lecturer at the University of Amsterdam. I also happen to see some of my students here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, power and protest. How can the 99% win? I think that's a very important question, but I just want to start that as protests and social movements, we often start with something else. We start with no, a scream. We say no against uh, the occupation uh, of countries. We start against uh, a no against the occupation of corporations, of our uh, uh, intellectual life, of our cultural life, of our social lives and so on and so further. So with a strong no. And that's what every protest movement starts with. But the important thing is that that's just the starting point and uh, it cannot be the end point. We have to start uh, with the following questions. And the most obvious important question is how can we win? How can we really change stuff? Because that's what brings confidence to the people around us who will join us. And actually as this movement, we have already started to do that. I will focus more on the analysis of the problems that we are facing, especially on strategy. Because to be honest, um, especially within the uh, intellectual left, the academic left, strategy is an ignored issue. Because everybody wants to talk about philosophy, criticism, political economy, and so on. But strategy is the hard work. You have to be an activist as well, and you have to engage and put yourself in the movements and learn from them and, and uh, uh, draw some conclusions. But before going to uh, the problems that we are facing and, and strategy, uh, I want to bring in two issues about um, two um, uh, dichotomical um, pitfalls, so, so, to, so to say. One is that when every social movement erupts, protests erupt, um, there can be a reaction of either cynicism or euphoria. You have seen the cynicism about this protest, especially in the media, like, okay, they don't really have an agenda, they don't know what the alternative is, they are demanding, but what they are really demanding, what do they mean about democracy and so on. That's, you know, the, the usual cynical journalists of, especially the Dutch media, but you have this in, in other countries as well. But there is another danger as well, especially among ourselves as activists and people who engage in social movements. And that's the pitfall of sheer euphoria. That look, we are here, we have occupied a building, and we are uh, seen, we are visible in the media. And that, then we think this and only this is enough, because we have now occupied a space and we are visible. And this, you know, euphoric um, idea can return and return every time. It, it was there, for instance, in the Occupy movements. I don't know if you have seen uh, the video on YouTube when Zizek goes there and speaks, he actually warns against falling in love with yourselves. And that's something I want to bring back as well, because we think, okay, look at us, we are here active, and in 20 uh, years we will show our kids, look, this is my picture, I was there. That's fantastic, but it's not enough. We have to see how we come further than the euphoria because we really want to establish some change. The second set of uh, pitfalls are uh, those of uh, what I would say the dogma of the old and the fetishism of the new. Because every social movement creates its own repertoires of action and creates its own ideas. Uh, so it always has um, also the know, saying, uh, you know, what the old movements did was all bad, nothing is good, and of course you have some people in the old movements, and that's the dogmatic way of it, saying that how we did it in the old days, it is good, and you should take it over as well. I don't think that's the right logic, because context, social context, economy, everything changes, and methods can change as well, but there is always continuity. Because if you go to the other extreme and think that everything new is just good because it is new, you fall into the pitfall of the fetishism of the new. You think, for instance, I mean, uh, consensus uh, development. Some people actually think it is new. It's not new. It, it developed in the 1970s 
by the Quakers, uh, uh, a religious uh, a movement. Or if you think that, you know, demonstration, we have already done that and we need something new. But for the majority of the people in the Netherlands, you know, demonstrations are not something new. We have participated in them. They haven't. Uh, or occupations are actually not new. I mean, they are uh, methods of the labor movement already in the 19th century. So we have to be careful of not falling in any of these pitfalls and be creative and combining the old and with the new methods and also moving uh, further than euphoria. Okay, having said that, um, what is the nature of the problems uh, that we are uh, uh, confronting? Sorry, I hope I won't talk, be talking too, too long. Just 10, 15 minutes more and then we'll come back to uh, questions and uh, comments. So what are the problems that we are facing? The problem that we are facing immediately here in the student protests is obviously in Dutch at random ends thinking, uh, you know, thinking from output pressure, uh, profit above the quality of our education, that money dominates everything, the management thinking. And it, it's a real problem. But we also have to realize that that problem is in the wider society as well. And maybe that is why we have mobilized so many sympathy. Because what we are screaming, lots of people have been saying for many, many years. I mean, if you work uh, in the healthcare uh, or in plants, in factories or whatever, the same problems are there as well, that profits are put above human lives. And that's a, that's a real uh, 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 problem. So we have that mentality of profit before everything, which you know invades every aspect of our uh, 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 society, economy, cultural life, and so on. Whereas uh, Marx was rightly observing, capital creates the world in its own image. And that's what it is doing with our education, with our healthcare, with our uh, work, uh, and, and, and so on. And I think social movements of the last 15 years have been addressing this question. I mean, in the globalization movement, we were talking about the power of uh, corporations and how they were the multinationals were taking over and so on. But I think something really positive happened in the past few years, and that was the slogan of, we are the 99% versus the 1%, which was coined during the Occupy movement. And I think that was a progress because it really relates to the social gap, social cleavage that is running through society. And it has started to actually put forward something which has been a taboo to talk about. Social class, that our societies are divided in social classes. And they are always prepared to sacrifice morals on the altar of profit. That's what they have always done, and that's what we always have ended, for instance, with wars and so on. So only a moral approach, and I think morals are, and values are very important, but we can't say, okay, you know, if just the 1% acts uh, morally, the problems are solved. The other approach is to um, see this gap as something natural. And often the political right and liberals do that, of course, by saying, you know, this is just in the DNA of people, this gap. But I already showed that if it was in the DNA, how has it been growing in the past 20 years? It is actually because the 1% has the power to accumulate more and extract more from the 99%. Uh, percent. So I won't go much into that. But there are, of course, also some people on the left coming from uh, the social democratic traditions, coming from NGOs, uh, the trade union bureaucracy, and so on, who also have moved towards accepting this cleavage, this social gap, 
but then saying the only thing we have to do is ameliorate that gap. Just give a bit more to the 99%, which is fine. I'm all for that. But the issue is that's, as Rosa Luxemburg was calling it, it's the labor of Sisyphus. Whenever we take some back, when they get stronger, they will take it back. In the 1960s and the 1970s, the labor movement, the uh, women's rights movement, and all social movements gained some rights. But in the past 20 years, they're all being taken away again by the new liberal uh, elite. So the issue of the gap is that it's much more structural embedded in our societies. And that, why is structural? It has something to do with, the, with, with this issue. That, you know, before wealth becomes uh, distributed unequally, it has to be produced, no? And this is something that people tend to forget, even within the left, and even within critical movements. It has to be produced. And it is at the, at the point of production that differences in power uh, emerge. The people who control the means of production, the industries, have the power to, you know, raise their own uh, uh, salaries, give themselves bonuses. They have the power to sack us as their workers or as students. We don't have that power over them. So it really uh, starts at the point of uh, uh, production, whether it is material production or immaterial production, like services uh, and so on. The second uh, structural issue is that capital is intertwined with the state, and that the state reproduces the social inequalities. You just have to look to how all kind of states over the world have reacted to the uh, economic crisis that broke out in 2008. They all, the crisis was not created by us, by people. But they said, you have to pay for it. You have to pay for the debts of the big companies. So they secured the profits of the companies. This happened also in Greece, making the people pay for those debts and you know, um, having the, uh, protecting the interests of the, of the companies. So the state is important. And the third factor is ideology, of course, how it is produced in the media, universities, education to reproduce that power. Okay, I'm going towards an end, because I also am eager to uh, hear your, uh, your uh, views on this. Um, within those approaches that see this gap as very structural, there are different approaches as well. Because some people, and I think, for instance, I don't know if anybody was at David Graeber's uh, talk today. I mean, David Graeber is one of those people that would actually say, we have to ignore that gap of uh, power. The concentration of power, power in the multinationals, in the state, in the media corporations, and so on. This is one approach of kind of ignoring it. And the strategy flows from there. It says, it goes somewhat like this. What we need to do is to create liberated zones, autonomous zones, as here, by taking over, occupying, but do this also bigger and bring those uh, zones together. Uh, and within those zones, we have to start prefigurative politics by, you know, living up to our ideals, just our social relations as they, uh, we want to have that. Um, I think it has really positive and uh, 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 strong points, this way of argumentation. But I want to point to the huge limitations it has as well, because we have seen the history of this kind of strategy. This, for instance, was the huge example uh, of kind of autonomous movements, of anarchist movements, when the Zapatistas took over Chiapas in Mexico. But what has happened with Chiapas? Chiapas has been isolated from the rest of Mexico. Poverty is still there, and it hasn't been able to break away from that isolation. The same goes for when we take over a place like this, Occupy. There's always the danger that the pull of power, which is the state, which is the military, which is the police, can of course come and take us away, which at one point they will try to do. So if you create an autonomous zone, a liberated zone, 
you haven't still solved the problem because you haven't tackled the power that can come and break you. And believe me, that's what it will do. Because we have just occupied, occupied the building. But you know what the Greece people did? They voted against the neoliberal elites in Europe. And see what the neoliberal elites are doing today. They have mobilized the power of the media, the power of capital, the financial markets, and actually put a gun on the head of the Greece, Greek people and said, you accept what we want or uh, you will perish. There is no money for you. So the issue, you cannot ignore power. You cannot ignore the state. You cannot ignore the police. You cannot ignore the army. It will come for you and it will crush you whenever it feels that you are getting too strong. That's the lesson from, uh, 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 from history as well. With this uh, method comes also three tactical methods as well. I want to just bring forward two, two of them. One is the method of putting forward no demands, because this was actually something during the Occupy movements. And I think during this action, we have actually moved forward by putting demands on the CBB, on the government, and fighting for those demands, because that kind of gives you the chance to mobilize wider support within the student uh, body, but also within society uh, itself. Um, the second issue is uh, the method of consensus. Again, I think it has very strong points as well, but we are in these small groups. But when we would try to organize on wider level within society, it also has its, its negative points. Because we, all, we already had it here. Sometimes these meetings go on for hours and hours. And it seems democratic. But people with children, people with jobs, people with uh, studies should be able to participate in those as well. So we have to be very careful about the methods that we create that actually are inclusive and not excluding people and not bringing forward only those people who have full time time to come to those meetings and engage with those uh, discussions. Uh, but also to be able to vote on issues, because I think that is uh, important. For instance, I have an uh, issue to take with, with Graeber, because um, he was also one of the activists within the Occupy movement. And in Oakland, in the US, the Black Bloc, um, which are part of the anarchist movements, went and trashed all shops and so on. And this created a huge debate within the uh, US uh, Occupy movement and radical movement, like, this is not the way. It says this is not how we want to build it. We want to have a huge movement in which everybody can participate, and we should be debating these issues as well. And Graeber said, you know, there should be just diversity of tactics. And if there is consensus on that, that's enough. I don't think that's enough. We have to have a debate within the movement about which tactics are more effective and can mobilize people or, or not. So, how to win this movement? And I will just be very, like, to the point uh, and really finish, finish there. We have to build counter power have a long-term strategy of building counterpower. This is what Gramsci was calling the war of position, which has to be combined with the war of movement, as, uh, as of maneuver, as we are doing here. The moments that we come together and we challenge uh, power, uh, those in power, but in the long term, we have to build alliances. Because it seems that, you know, it's great that we are here with hundreds of us, but you have to think that the UVA has thousands of students. Our challenge is how to reach out to them, how to bring them and involve them as well. The UVA has staff members, we have to bring them in. And then the problem is not solved because there are many other uh, uh, universities. And how do we build bridges towards them? And the problem is even then not solved because again, the logic of profit above everything is within old society. You know, it was great that we had the cleaners here to bring their message of solidarity. But it is exactly those kind of struggles of cleaners, of workers, of laborers, that really can damage the centers of power, of neoliberal power, and break their, uh, uh, their back. So we have to bring in, put forward kind of demands that allow us to bridge all the, 
um, uh, constituencies. Um, and yeah, let me just finish finish by that. And um, I really would to love to hear your comments and, and questions, and also to see how we can take this action further uh, to further successes.